We have been in a series now in, in, uh, in the book of uh, Habakkuk uh, for the last uh, three, this will be the third Sunday, right? So we're looking uh, at this book in, in various ways, right? Kind of walking through uh, this. And we, today we're going to meet a more mature Habakkuk, right? He began by being confused in chapter 1 and decided to kind of wait and see what God might be saying in chapter 2. And now he's finding God. And so now, uh, you know, how do we, how do we actually uh, recognize that it's God when he shows up uh, or when we see that he has uh, shown up, so to speak? You know, I read a, a kind of a research thing uh, that they did it's a little while ago. They, they did it with chickens. And uh, they put them in a cage, and there were two buttons. One was green, the other was red. And they made it so that when they pecked on, on, the, on the green button, some chicken food would come out, right? Some grains, some little ones for chicken to eat. And when they pecked on the red button, nothing happened. And as you have already guessed now, right, it didn't take all that long until the chickens kind of figured out that they were going to peck on, on the green button. And food would come out, and, and that's what they did. They went straight to that, and they would touch the red button again. And then they decided, you know, let's just swap the function of the two buttons. And again, they, you know, the chickens just went straight to the green button and, and nothing came out. They tried for a little bit and then they stopped. It's not that they tried any other thing. It's not that they said, you know, I may have to rethink the process with which I get, you know, some response to my picking, so to speak. It made me think how often our prayers as Christians are kind of chicken-like. You know, we have something happen, and we pray to God, and we anticipate a quick, immediate answer to the way we pray in the way we want him to answer us, and we pray that a few times, and then when we find there's no response to the button, or to the prayer, we just kind of stop praying. And I wonder, I wonder sometimes if that is because we have, we think a prayer as this supernatural button, so to speak, that, that if we push it right, it should give us what we want immediately as we do it? Or is it because we forget that even when prayers, as we have seen in the two previous chapters also, when, when, when it seems as if even either God is absent or he is delaying his, his response, that that must mean that he is not engaged. And we, we're forgetting that he is engaged, that, that, that even silence, that seemingly silence from God is not empty silence. God always hears our prayers. Are we forgetting sometimes that, that maybe God is interested in more than simply fulfilling our wish list? people's prayer and God's answer or response, of course, is a topic that uh, I think all of us have struggled with every now and again. And so as we come to this last chapter in, in this great, great book of Habakkuk, we, we see that, that that he moves, right? And now he's, he's, he's not just confused. Why is God not answering or, or just granting me my wish list in chapter 1? Or, 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 or why is it that, that, that I'm not getting things in the speed that I want it in chapter 2? And he just decided, okay, I'm going to wait. I've grown enough to see. I realize God was maybe in, involved anyway. And so now, as he's standing in the Outlook Tower, Chapter 3, he is finding that God actually has been engaged, that he can trust what's going on, that God has not forgotten his people. Let me read from chapter 3. A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk, according to Shaganov. That is a sense, you know, kind of a psalm 
It's a poetic kind of expression, passionate kind of way of saying things. Lord, I have heard the report about you. Or as it could be translated, I have heard of your fame or I know of your reputation. And so, Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Tima, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His brilliance is like light, rays are flashing from his hand. This is where his power is hidden. We jump down to verse 17. Though the fig trees does not bud, and there is no fruit on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there is no herds in the stall, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. You know, prayer and faith are instricately bound together. Moored may even be the better word here. What you truly believe about God will be expressed through your prayer. Or I may even turn that around and say, listen to your own prayers. That will reveal to you what you truly believe. Believe about God. Because a person who, who does not truly believe that God is able to intervene or to change things in your life or your situation or maybe even on the world stage, they will only pray little. Or they will utter chicken-like type prayers for a short time. They will pray poorly. There's a huge difference even in the way you access and the way you approach prayer. That is exactly what Jesus' half-brother James is saying when he says, you ask and you receive nothing. Why? Because you pray badly. Now, now, we have cleaned up that language. We don't like it that raw, right? So we say, so you pray with the wrong motives. If you look at, in James, you will see that, chapter 4. But the word there is you pray badly or poorly. You're not anticipating. You know, as a famous theologian, uh, the professor, uh, probably the most uh, revered one uh, from the 20th century, at least one of them, uh, Karl Barth, highlights one side of this when he says, we pray because we believe that through prayer we will affect the act of God. Now, he's not trying to suggest that we determine the act of God. That is God's sovereignty to do the way he pleased. But he does highlight, and it is important to understand that prayers matter to God that we affect it. God is listening and God is eager to respond to our prayer in love. You know, I heard a funny story. I hope you won't misunderstand, but it's kind of funny. Um, so here's this little village. It, it is outside of, of the hustle and bustle of, of the cities and the town, kind of off to a side a little bit. And they have been spared for, for much of the difficulties and the pain and the struggles that happens in the cities and larger towns and all that. And, and, and the little church, the village church that was there, had decided that is because they, they have avoided having any kind of raucous places, you know, no places to drink, no places for people to get drunk and all that. 
And now, all of a sudden, permission was given for someone to build a bar, and that even across the street from the little village church. And the building went up, and the, and the church people were just appalled, and, and they gathered, and they said, we have to find a way to stop that. And so they said, let's have a prayer night, a full night. We all gather in the church. We'll pray for God to stop this evil. This drinking hole, they said, all the names that they would call it. And they did. And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, a terrible weather came through town, and a lightning struck the bar and burned it to the ground. And the bar owner was infuriated, angry to want to sue the church. And the church, of course, quickly responded by hiring a lawyer to defend them and say they wasn't their fault. And so the case was going on, and everybody was heard, and then the, the judge said, okay, I'm going to give it to the jury now. And, but whatever the jury decide, one thing has become very clear through this case. The bar owner believes in prayer. The church people don't. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Friends, prayer is not just words spit into empty air, so to speak. It is a cry of the heart to God, a cry that exactly has the direction of God because it is birthed in the soil of faith. Faith that God has the power to do what he wants, to change what he wants, to occasion whatever he wants to occasion. You know, a mere string of words that are thrown in the air, hoping that, that someone will give an answer someplace in some way. Those kinds of things, as James says also, shall not expect to hear from God. True prayer, friends, grows in the soil of faith, trusting that God is almighty and he wants to respond. He loves the prayers of his people and is eager to show his love through it. And I wonder, I'm just going to have to ask you straight up, is that the way your prayers are turned, so to speak? Are we getting this? Not just I hear the words that he's speaking, but are we truly getting this about prayer? Maybe I can speak to it a little bit more because it gets to this point also that, that Habakkuk is, is dealing with here, right? There is a side of this that, that I probably should, should mention that, that in the last several decades, it seems to me that, that we have so changed that whole understanding of things we have highlighted the, the element of faith. And, and it becomes something different, right? So, so, you know, I have faith that this can happen, right? You know, believe in yourself. You, know, you need to have faith enough. And the object of faith, God himself seems to sometimes get second place. We just need to have sufficient faith. Just think of this. Believe in yourself. You must believe in yourself that this can happen. And, and, and it seems less important to mention that you need to trust in God. And before we know it, we turn prayer into the deliverance of a wish list that we have faith can happen because faith has become now the way we pay for these things. I trust you hear me. That may work, friends, when everything is good, when life is smooth, things are going your way. Just kind of give it your all, and it'll be fine. And then, you know, bring God in on it a little bit. But when life is tough, 
When life is hard, when everything comes at you like this, when there's nothing to smile about, when there's no smile to be found any place in your heart, when darkness overwhelms, when pain is too deep, and no one can help you by saying, just believe in yourself, then suddenly you realize that the only prayer that has power is the prayer that reaches for the depths of God, not for your own strength, to just, that, that lowers its anger, if you will, into the faithfulness of God. That is the point, the Christian prayer that is connecting with God's power and asking him for, for his deliverance, that he will reveal himself in his way and allow you to see him that's the kind of strength that will lift you to the heights of heaven and see your faith be strengthened rather than weakened when life's buffeting can be hard. Because we know that God's love demands that he will respond in due kind to us with love, eagerness, to show himself as our Lord. I hope you see the difference, friends. If you do, if these are not just words, but if you do see the difference, it will change the way you look at who God is. It will change the way you look at who yourself is. And that, friend, is where we meet Habakkuk. The mature Habakkuk that shows up in chapter 3. Remember we found it confused in chapter 1. Why did God not just do things according to the way Habakkuk thought it made sense for him to do it? And then he decides that maybe God is God and he is not. And so he will stand on the outlook to see what God may, may do. And that results in this, this time here in chapter 3 where suddenly he has come to the realization that God is God. I'm not. I better listen to him. I can recognize him and praise him even when things are hard. And so now, in full poetic form, like we, we just said here in uh, Shaganath, in this beautiful psalmic kind of, or hymnic kind of way, from his lips flows a prayer, an intercession, supplication, thanksgiving, if you will, on behalf of himself and his people to God. And so what do we see? That he's recognizing that God is doing his work, and so he's asking here, he says, would you revive that in these days? Or years, as it says here, right? As now we live, what you had done before, maybe not in the same way, but we will see your hand again in these days. It is a powerful kind of way when, when he says was this poetic depth, right? We have heard about the report that is given about you. And we stand in awe of who you are and what you're doing, O oh Lord. So, let it happen. These days. Again. Here's a prayer, friends, and I hope you hear that, whose expectation is grounded and rooted in the experience that God is God. And Habakkuk is just a man. And he shouldn't confuse the two. God is the one who acts. He's the one who says, this is what I will do. Only he, God Almighty, as he has revealed himself through his son Jesus Christ and made salvation possible through him, only he will say. And Habakkuk places himself in the right position to hear 
God's voice. And that is in the position of humility. His eyes have been moved away from the problems that tower up everywhere as he is concerned. He's no longer blinded by the misstep of the people. He is no longer just kind of confused or, 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 or looking at the gruesome kind of uh, acts of his enemy. No, his eyes had been moved and turned toward God. And his focus, his prayer life, now in humility before the Lord. Lord, do it again. Now, he's keenly aware, as you can imagine, that God's wrath might visit disobedience. He's not shying away from that. But it is because that he has lowered his anger in, into God's action and God's mercy and God's care that he's now able to express this prayer of faith, affirming who God is and asking God to make himself visible, trusting that God will intervene even when he can't see it at first, but he will do it even in these days. And then comes what has to be one of the most incredible joy-filled expressions of God's sovereignty and power that you'll ever see. Can you follow me in verse 17? Even if the fig trees do not bud, even if there's no fruit on the vines, even if the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, even if the flock disappears from the pen and, and there's no herd in the stalls, I will still celebrate the Lord. I'll rejoice in the God of my salvation because the Lord is my strength. Are we hearing this? Do I need to translate that into modern English for you? Let me just do that. What he's saying, even if I lose my job, even if my health fails, even if all the powers of hell kind of seem to be gathering and attacking me all, all at once, e even if my financial situation collapses, e even if I'm passed over at the promotion at my job, even if all my friends are leaving me, I will never stop celebrating the goodness of God because he and he alone is my strength. There's no turning to, you know, believe in yourself. Just give it your all. Trust in God. He has the power to change everything. How do you recognize God when he shows up? You will know when that is how your prayers are turned. You hear what is happening, yes? You see the movement in his life as he grows in his understanding. People who love God, people who have sunk their anchor into the faithfulness and trustworthiness of God will see God show up even when he could have been invisible. They want to recognize that there is true power to real human problems, not just cute little things where we put a smile on the face and say it's going to be okay, but real issues. This is really what's going on. And you see the exact same thing in Psalm 23. I thought about that because everybody kind of knows that. All the people who would don't go to church. People who are not Christians, many have heard Psalm 23. And if that had been expressed in that kind of wish list kind of form, we would have anticipated that David had said, you know, Lord, I have faith that you will not lead me down through dark alleys, 
that you will not lead me into difficult places, that I will not face the valley of darkness and death. But he doesn't say that, does he? He says, oh yeah, even if I shall walk through the valley of the darkest darkness, the valley of death, I fear no evil because your rod and your staff is with me and comfort me. Are you hearing this? Trusting the strength and the power of God because you lowered your anchor into the bedrock of his faithfulness and his love. That the prayer of the mature Habakkuk. And that's your prayer, I trust. Or it can't become that if it has not been that so far. Can I ask you this? What is the direction of your prayer? Where does your faith find its true strength? You're bound into this notion, I just need to have enough faith. Or you're leaning toward God and say, I trust you. I lower my anchor and I just live and trust. Friends, it's not the words that you speak that counts. Not that words are not important. But what matters is where your faith and your prayer are sinking its roots. That's really what matters. It's a God that you worship, the almighty, powerful God, the heavenly Father who has made himself known in Jesus Christ and said, this is who I am, and, and through my Son, I'll make salvation possible to pull you out and to walk with you through the darkest moments into light where even if everything else fails, you know I'm there. If that has not been how it turned, don't despair. This is a great, great emphasis in the beginning here that God will remember his mercy. God remembers his mercy. When, when you have been, maybe before this, and I don't know where you are if you're listening someplace else, have been powerless in face of your life, turn and remember that his mercy is always powerful and stronger than anything else. He will take care of you. Some of you need to move with Habakkuk from the point of frustration, I don't understand, to the point where you recognize I better be on the outlook and get to the point where you can say, I've seen God. Lord, will you speak to us? Even in this moment, Allow us to know of your grace, the transforming power to see life in a new light, to catch a new vision for how you can be involved in our life and will be and is. I ask, Lord, there are some here who need this more than others. Would you speak right now, individually and to all of us, as individuals with our homes, in our loneliness, in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, wherever we are, as your church here on this beautiful corner, great place, 
speak to us. We need to be moved to this point where we can stand by and shout out with our back. We, Lord, are looking for you and we see you. May your grace and your glory be clear to us all. Make it happen, even in these days. Amen.